This morning, before we, we continue, I just want to remind everyone, we've got the pet blessing this afternoon at 2, so if you have a furry friend, uh, or scaly, or feathery, you know, whatever you got, uh, you, you be sure to bring them by, and uh, uh, if they are of a furry variety, uh, we have some treats for them. Um, I even got some of those kitty leaky treats that they like, so... You know, uh, hopefully the, all the cats will like me. No guarantee there, but uh, uh, so, so that, that is uh, today. So I want to remind everyone about that um, as well. Let us uh, pray. Lord, as your scriptures are read and proclaimed this day, we ask that by the power of your Holy Spirit, that our hearts, our minds, and our very lives may be transformed by your Holy Scripture. Thank you for your gift of Scripture, we pray. Amen. Wasn't it nice to have a big group for uh, children's moments today? What do you think? Yeah, isn't, isn't that wonderful to see? Yeah. It's great to, to see a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of eager young uh, faces sitting up here. Um, although it, it is always interesting when I say, would you like to go to junior church, i.e. skip the sermon? How many are just ready to head out the door? And I look out to you and some of you are like, can we go too? You know? You think I don't see, I see. Oh, I see. But we enjoy that, don't we? Because it shows that, uh, that uh, uh, our church not only is, is vital and, and has a, a future, but it also shows us in a very tangible way how not all Christians are exactly alike. In this case, we're talking about age, right? Uh, that, that not all Christians are of the same age, uh, that there, there are, are some young, some middle-aged, some n not so young. But there's a diversity in Christianity. There's a diversity in the followers of Christ. If we look around the church uh, in general, and, and I'm meaning ch church as the followers of Jesus Christ, we, we see that there's you know, around a billion Christians in the world. Not all of them look like us. Not all of them worship like us. Not all of them dress like us. Not all of them have the same exact beliefs and understandings that we do. But we all have one thing in common, and that is this. We are followers of the risen Christ. As Christians, it's important for us to realize that not every follower of Jesus looks just like us. Not every follower of Jesus believes exactly the way we do. Not every follower of Jesus speaks the same language we do. And that's okay because Christ's love, Christ's grace, what Christ did on the cross for us, crosses all human-made bounds. Bounds of culture, bounds of language, bounds of, of uh, uh, nation states, beyond political ideologies and theological stances. Jesus is for everyone. This morning, as we finish up our look at the Apostle Peter, Peter finds out this very fact. And he does so in the most amazing way. Just to uh, remind everyone uh, a little bit about Peter uh, and where we left off with Peter. Uh, after the resurrection, uh, Jesus comes back to him and uh, uh, reinstates him, if you will. 
after Jesus, uh, or after Peter had denied Jesus three times uh, during his trial and arrest. And so Peter, after he is reinstated by the resurrected Jesus, becomes once again the leader of this new Christian movement and really becomes a bit of a rock star, if you will. He is going about first Jerusalem and then into other parts of of Israel, spreading the good news of Jesus Christ and continuing the ministry that Jesus had begun. And some amazing things are happening in the ministry of of Peter. For instance, uh, there was one uh, dedicated Christian woman by the name of Tabitha, and she died. She, She lived in the city of Joppa. Uh, and, and Peter was asked to come and to pray for her, and he does, and as he's praying, he reaches down and he touches Tabitha, and he says, Tabitha, in the name of Jesus, get up! And she opened her eyes, and she sat up. Could you imagine that? Could you imagine being at the funeral and and, and someone in the name of Jesus touches someone and the guest of honor sits up? That's enough to to, to, to make make you want to, you know, get off your diet. But that happened. Acts 9.42 says this, after that incident, the news spread throughout Joppa and many put their faith in the Lord. I bet you they did. (laughs) That's some amazing stuff right there. Peter remained in Joppa and he stayed in the home of a guy named Simon the Tanner. I love names in the Bible or even older names where you had the person's name and their job. It would be like Rick the Preacher. Right? You always knew who they were, what they did. And this is Simon the Tanner. And uh, one day Peter is there at Simon's house and he's praying and, and he gets this vision from God. And in this vision is this tablecloth coming down from heaven and it's got all of this great looking food on it. However, all of this food is stuff that devout Jews were not allowed to eat, according to the Old Testament. Things like pork, shellfish. And he hears this voice say, Peter, take and eat. And Peter's like, I I can't. It's against the rules of my faith. I am a faithful follower of, 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 of you, Jesus and of the Jewish faith, and, and, and I can't eat this. And this voice finally keeps saying, take and eat. And, and Peter, it, all of a sudden, it clicks in his mind, and Peter understands what he's being told. Jesus says, don't make what I made clean, unclean. And, 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 and Peter understands this to mean that all of these dietary rules that he was following because he thought he had to, he didn't need to. Because the love of Jesus was greater than any sort of man-made rules and that those who weren't part of the Jewish faith were also being called to be followers of Jesus. And Peter realizes that this ministry started by another faithful uh, disciple by the name of Paul, Hmm, maybe Paul's on to something here. This ministry to Gentiles, non-Jewish people. Basically, you and me. And then Peter goes and has this most amazing interaction with a guy named Cornelius. This is what happens. Peter uh, hears this voice that says, You need to go. You need to go with these people that are going to come and, 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 and they're going to ask for you and, and they're going to take you to, to this Cornelius guy and you need to go with them. And sure enough, the, these people from Cornelius come and, and they say, 
uh, our, 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 our master, Cornelius, has sent us to come get you. You see, Cornelius has been praying, and he's had a similar vision that said, look, you need to, to send, send some of your uh, uh, servants to go to Joppa and get this Peter and bring him back. You two need to meet. And so they do in the city of Caesarea. Cornelius. Cornelius is a, a Roman officer. Uh, he is what is known as a centurion. A centurion uh, was head of a century. A century of soldiers. How many men do you think is in a century of soldiers, if I had, you had to guess? You would think 100, right? Because a century? No, 80. Um, yeah, 80. I don't know. I didn't do that much research to find out why that is. Uh, maybe just because the Romans wanted to mess with us in the future. I don't know. So there's about 80 soldiers in a century. And a group of these centuries that make up a cohort. Uh, Cornelius was, in, was part of, uh, of what was known as the Italian cohort because all of these soldiers came actually from Italy and instead of other parts of the Roman Empire. And they were part of the, the bigger legion that was stationed there in Israel. And the cool thing about a Roman centurion uh, well, a couple of cool things. First, they got really cool helmets. If you ever see any of the Roman uh, like movies, they're the guys that, that uh, on the top of their helmet have those uh, big crests on the top. Uh, mostly in the movies, you see them made out of horse, red horse hair, as you dyed red, red that go across this way. Uh, but they could also be made out of feathers, uh, other type of things. And, and it went this way across their helmets, so all of their men could see them in battle. And one of the unique things about a Roman centurion is that this wasn't a political position. See, most of the other officers in a Roman legion were political appointees, uh, especially those who were leading the, the legions. Uh, they were aristocrats who were appointed uh, to be head of a legion or a, uh, a cohort because uh, they wanted to get this experience in the military to help their political careers. Not that we would ever have that today, right? People doing things just to uh, you know, promote their careers. But a centurion couldn't just be appointed. A centurion had to earn their job. See, they were taken from the rank and file soldiers. Centurions were those who uh, had been there, done that, and that's why their men trusted them, because they had the experience of battle. They had the experience of being in the military. They were the ones who the men looked to to keep them alive. Centurions were common folk, and they had been raised up because of their valor. And they could also gain wealth. Centurions often uh, were appointed uh, uh, to certain uh, administrative jobs within the empire. And it was a way for uh, those of lower classes to make good money, because uh, often uh, all of the, uh, the positions that paid good money were held by those in the nobility. And so Cornelius, we we're told, had some money. Cornelius had some servants. Cornelius was doing well. He was respected, but he was something else. He was a follower of the risen Jesus Christ. He wasn't somebody you would expect to be a Christian. Sometimes we run into that, don't we? I remember a number of uh, years ago, I was working at a food pantry run by our church, and there were these guys that showed up to help with Thanksgiving turkeys, and they all got off their motorcycles, and they all, all had their, like, you know, motorcycle uh, vests on and, and all of this, and, 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 you know, they had these big beards and chains, and I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> I've seen this movie. I know how this ends. And they got off, and it turns out they were a Christian motorcycle group. Didn't know this existed. It does. 
and they were there to help, help, help distribute the turkeys, right? But these weren't people, when you just looked at them, that you would think were Christians. Christians are everywhere. We just don't always, we just don't always look like Christians or what we would stereotypically think. And Peter thought that when he goes to meet with Cornelius. Imagine this. He, Peter goes and he meets with Cornelius. And the, for the first time, I'm sure he's thinking, uh-oh, this guy, he's lying. He's just trying to, to, to get me to blow my cover as a Christian so he could arrest me like they did Jesus. And there was some trepidation there. But eventually, Peter trusts Cornelius. And he trusts him because other people in the community tell Peter, look, Cornelius is a good guy. Cornelius is, is helping those who are in need. He helps the poor. He helps other uh, followers of Jesus with their needs. He helps to fund the ministries here. He's a dedicated man. Don't worry about that uniform he wears. And it reminded Peter, and it should remind us, that Jesus doesn't look at our outside. He looks at what's in our hearts. Amen? Hmm? Now, we often will judge people by what they look like or, or, or where they come from, but Jesus doesn't do that. And that's the glory of this story with Cornelius. I love this quote from Anne Lamott, who's a, an author. She writes this. She, she writes, You can safely assume that you've created Jesus in your own image when it turns out that Jesus hates all the same people you do. <laughs> Have you ever thought about that? If Jesus hates the exact same people you do, you have made Jesus into, your, into you, right? You've made Jesus into an idol of yourself. Because even though it can be very uncomfortable for us, Jesus loves those who we sometimes don't. And that, I think, is the way it should be. And that is how we grow as Christians. We grow when we start to realize that Jesus' love is bigger than us, that, that, that Jesus' love goes beyond us. I want to finish with this quote from Billy Graham. He says this, he says, Being a Christian is more than just an instantaneous conversion. It is a daily process whereby you grow to be more and more like Christ. And I think we become more and more like Christ as we start to care for those who Christ cares for. When we accept those who Christ accepts. Peter, through all of his flaws, was a dedicated disciple and what Peter's story should tell us is that we don't have to be perfect to follow the risen Christ. We just have to be faithful and willing to follow Jesus where he leads. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the example of Peter, for his ability to make mistakes and continue right along with you. Help us to do the same. In the name of our risen Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen.